Welcome back to this special edition of Hannity, Dual Threat, Political Correctness and Jihad. As young Muslim doctor in Egypt, my next guest turned to radical Islam, but after witnessing firsthand the horrors of terrorism, he turned his life around. He spent the last couple of decades warning about the dangers of Islamic extremism. Joining me now is the author of Inside Jihad, How Radical Islam Works, Why It Should Terrify Us, and How to Defeat It. Dr. Tafiq Hamid. Dr. Hamid, it's great to see you tonight. Pleasure um, to be with so you. What, uh, boil it down for us. We keep reading stories here in the U.S. of young people, um, American yeah. citizens are naturalized, but fully, full participants in American society joining ISIS or supporting it materially. What is the appeal? The appeal for them is the desire to serve the religion and serve God. And this desire is unfortunately directed in the wrong path. It's like if you have nuclear energy, for example, you can give light with it and you can destroy a city with it. The same here, you have energy, desire to serve the religion. And when the traditional or mainstream religious, religious teaching teaches certain values that creates hatred and trend toward violence, then you would expect this outcome at the end for people who are very dedicated in this path. Yes, you, you would. So you're describing very clearly a religious impulse. These people aren't mad about global warming. They're not mad about poverty or oppression. They're trying to serve God, as you just said. It seems obvious. They say it out loud. Why do you think our leaders here, our president among them, refuse to acknowledge that? Uh, I think they, uh, they do not want to confront the reality that religious teaching has a major role in the phenomena. Uh, it, let me ask just a basic question here for everyone. If poverty and lack of education and the socioeconomic and political circumstances are the cause of the problem, why these factors do not affect the young non-Muslims who live under the same circumstances? Why specifically young Muslims are more prone to these factors if these are the true factors? So I think we need to ask ourselves about certain basic concepts that we, we thought it's, we have to believe in them, like tolerance, for example. Many people think the U.S. became a beacon for liberty and democracy because of tolerance. In fact, it is the opposite. Because the U.S. was intolerant, it became beacon for liberty and democracy. For example, had the U.S. been tolerant to slavery, slavery would exist today. Because we were intolerant to slavery, then we became beacons for liberty and democracy. So actually, we need to really set the definitions correct here to be able to take correct decisions. And I don't see, see the leadership are able to basically define the problem. Right. And you can't if you, yeah. M much less defend American values against it because they don't understand what American values are. Freedom of expression, of course, is the most basic of all American values, and they're willing to toss it out the window in an effort to placate people who won't be placated. Um, so how do you fight against it, though? I mean, if this is a religious impulse and people think they're serving yeah. God, how do you convince them they're not? You have three levels of intervention here. The first level is when someone is militant. You need to deal with, with them uh, at a militant level or security level or you destroy them, militants, by using force. You have some other group, a radical group, who have tendency to become terrorists. And these people need a very powerful psychological warfare or psychological operations to deter them from doing the act of evil or terrorism. Because for the terrorists or the jihadists, it is a win-win-win situation. If they died on earth, they will go to paradise where they have 72 virgins. If they conquer the area, they will control it by Sharia and they will achieve their goal. They are victorious. If they were caught by Western nations, they will be protected by human rights activists and values. So for them, it is a win-win situation. And we need a strong deterrence to prevent these radicals from continuing in the path of terror. Also, at the level of normal individuals, we need to work through religious reformation, reinterpretation of the religious text, plus rechanging the thinking process that breeds radicalism and hatred. There is certain thinking traits that you can modify using certain cognitive psychological tactics right. that ultimately can, can prevent this phenomena. Are, are you convinced, doctor, that uh, the American Muslim establishment is doing enough to convince young Muslims in this country not to follow that path? Of course not. To do enough means you come to the radical teaching one by one and either reinterpret it or consider it uh, uh, contextualized in certain time and the place and have very cl have clarity about certain principles 
like killing apostates, like beating women, like stoning women to death, like declaring jihad or non-Muslim to subjugate them to Islam and taking their women as war prisoners. If there is no clear stand against these values and the principles, then we are really in, in trouble. And I don't see the religious leaders of the Muslim world taking clear stand no. about, about these values. No, you never do. And, and you look at the polling and the overwhelming majority of Muslims all through the Middle East believe, the majority of them believe that apostates should be killed. And you never hear anybody stand up and say that out loud. Absolutely. Mm. Dr. This is the core, yeah, this is the core of the problem. When you underestimate human life for an apostate, then you underestimate the human life for everyone else. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's a wise point, and I hope that everyone hears you. I hope your message uh, goes far and wide in this country. Thanks a lot, Doctor, for, for explaining that. Appreciate it. My honor.